Now, the anomaly in Mercury's orbit meant that Mercury executed one orbit uh, extra per million Mercurian years. So it's a one in a million anomaly. But nonetheless, it could not be explained by Newton's theory of gravity. <laughs> to sort of set the scene a little bit and to talk about why anomalies are such, uh, are such interesting things as scientists, I'm going to tell a little historical story. I'm going to take you back uh, to the 19th century. So um, in 1846, on New Year's Eve, uh, there was a rural French doctor called Edmond Lescarbot who was sitting at home in his, in his house in a village about uh, two hours outside of Paris when there was an unexpected knock at the door. And when he answered the door, he found himself confronted by the figure of Urbain Le Verrier, who was France's foremost astronomer, the director of the Imperial Observatory in Paris, and the recent, recently lauded for the prediction of the planet Neptune. Now, Le Verrier was a very large, imposing figure. He basically forced his way into Lescarbot's hallway without so much as a how you do and demanded to inspect his astronomical equipment. And the reason he was there was a week earlier, Lescarbot had been sitting leafing through a astronomical journal. Lescarbot, as well as being a physician, was actually a very keen amateur astronomer, and he built an observatory on the edge of his, his rural house in, in, uh, the, in the French countryside. And he read an article by Le Verrier uh, talking about the planet Mercury. Now, Mercury was a planet that had been causing real trouble to astronomers for several decades. Uh, particularly when they were trying to observe this phenomenon. So this is a little time-lapse vi video from the Solar Dynamics Observatory of a transit of Mercury across the face of the Sun. So you can see this is the Sun and then the tiny little black dot is the planet Mercury. Now, astronomers had attempted to calculate when Mercury's transits ought to occur based on the established theory of the universe at the time, which was Newton's law of gravitation. But they kept finding that they kept missing Mercury's transit, sometimes by an hour or two, but in one extreme case, actually by an entire day. And this was in a time in the 19th century where the universe was supposed to run like a clockwork mechanism. So a planet with poor timekeeping was really very, very disturbing indeed. Now, Le Verrier, the eminent astronomer from Paris, he had recently solved a similar problem with the orbit of the planet Uranus, which, like Mercury, was not conforming to the predictions of Newton's law of gravity. And the solution to this problem was to predict the existence of an eighth unseen planet beyond the orbit of Uranus, whose gravity was perturbing Uranus's orbit and causing it to disagree with the predictions of Newton's theory. And when Le Verrier told astronomers where this eighth planet should appear in the sky and they pointed their telescopes, they duly discovered the planet Neptune. So this was uh, a huge coup, made Le Verrier incredibly famous, and he now thought he could pull off the same trick with the planet Mercury. And in this article that Les Garbeau had read, he, wrote, he proposed a planet in between the orbit of, er of Mercury and the Sun, so a tiny scorched world that could easily have been lost in the Sun's dazzling glare, whose gravitational influence was changing Mercury's orbit ever so slightly and leading to it uh, disagreeing with the predictions of Newton's theory. Now, when Les Garbeau read Le Verrier's article, he was immediately reminded of a strange thing that he'd seen in March earlier that year. When making observations of the sun, he had seen a little black dot appear on its surface, move across and then disappear. Now, Les Garbeau hadn't been very confident in what he'd actually seen. He'd made notes of it and then sort of just dismissed it and forgotten about it. But when he read about Le Verrier's prediction, he thought, aha, maybe I have discovered this predicted planet. So Le Verrier, he then written a letter to Le Verrier and the letter had so excited Le Verrier that despite it being New Year's Eve, he had immediately jumped on a train from Paris and was soon hammering on Les Garbeau's front door. Now, the description of this, it, this interaction was very interesting. I think Les Garbeau was quite a kind of like humble, modest, you know, mild-mannered guy. Le Verrier, this sort of very grand figure who just kind of barges his way into the hallway, it, it de forces his way into the observatory, inspects Les Garbeau's equipment, finds it relatively satisfactory, then submits Les Garbeau to a fearsome interrogation, at which one observer described as the meeting of a lion and a lamb. And then to cap it all off, Le Verrier went round the village and interviewed all of Les Garbeau's uh, patients, basically to check he wasn't being taken in by a confidence trickster. And by the end of the day, though, Le Verrier was assured that actually this rural doctor had indeed discovered uh, his predicted planet. And a few days later, he announced to the French Academy the discovery of a planet that he called Vulcan, which is this world in between the orbit of Mercury and the Sun. Now, this caused international uh, sensation in the French press and the British press. Uh, Les Garbeau ended up being awarded the Légion d'honneur for his discovery of this planet. And Le Verrier, was, his reputation was enhanced even further. 
Now, you probably haven't heard of planet Vulcan, or if you have, you know, it's not a member of the solar system. It does appear in Star Trek. Um, what actually happened then was Leverrier attempted to calculate when Vulcan should show up again. So when would it transit the sun in the future? And when astronomers tried to find these transits, it didn't show up when predicted. And this went on for decades through the 19th century. There were occasional sporadic sightings, but no one was ever really able to pin down where this planet was. And by the early years of the 20th century, astronomers were forced to conclude that this planet that had caused such a sensation and led to all these awards being given out actually did not exist. But nonetheless, the problem with the orbit of Mercury remained. And the solution to this problem was, was far more profound. So just to illustrate actually what, what was going on. So Mercury orbits the sun in an ellipse like all the planets do. And that ellipse doesn't stay fixed in space. It actually rotates, the ellipse itself, the orbit rotates as Mercury goes around the sun. And this means that Mercury actually orbits the sun slightly more often than just you would get if it just went round in a fixed ellipse. Now the anomaly in Mercury's orbit meant that Mercury executed one orbit uh, extra per million Mercurian years. So it's a one in a million anomaly, but nonetheless, it could not be explained by Newton's theory of gravity. The solution actually eventually came from this man. So this is Albert Einstein. Not as you're probably used to seeing him. This is Einstein actually at the height of his powers when he was in his 30s. This, is ta this photograph was taken in 1915. And in 1915, Einstein was at the, the final stages of completing what would prove to be his masterpiece, a theory that became known as the general theory of relativity. Now, this was a radical reimagining of the concepts of space and time and gravity. And it had been a, a seven year labor, uh, essentially working pretty much on his own with very, very difficult mathematics. And as Einstein was completing the theory, the first thing he did was use it to calculate the orbit of Mercury. And when he did this, he found that it accurately, perfectly accounted for this one in a million anomaly that had been persisting in astronomy for, for decades. Now, Einstein was so excited by this that he described having heart palpitations that had to have a lie down. Um, and so I tell you this story because it really shows the power of these tiny little anomalies in reshaping our understanding of the universe. And Einstein rather nicely said that after this episode, um, he came to have a new appreciation for the kind of fastidiousness of astronomers for measuring the positions of stars and planets to some very high precision, which he used to previously make fun of as a sort of nerdy obsession. But he then came to appreciate just how important precision is if you want to be able to make profound discoveries. And, and just to give you a sense of just how profound general relativity is, I mean, what general relativity says is that gravity, this force that Newton had described, doesn't actually really exist. There is no such thing as the force of gravity. Gravity is, a, is an effect really of the fact that massive objects like the sun bend the fabric of space-time itself. So in Einstein's theory, space-time isn't just a coordinate system. It's a physical dynamical object that can be stretched and bent and made to vibrate by energy and mass. And the reason that planets go around the sun is because essentially they're rolling around this depression in space-time, a little bit like a bowling ball on an elastic sheet with a ping pong ball rolling around it. Um, the, the reason, actually interestingly, the reason that this shows up in the orbit of Mercury is because Mercury is the closest planet to the sun and it's in this strongest gravitational field and that's where the difference between Newton and Einstein's theory show up most clearly. Now, this general relativity went on to have an incredibly profound impact on our understanding of the universe. It led more or less directly to the Big Bang theory of the origin of the universe, led to black holes in terms of our understanding of black holes, gravitational waves, and many more besides. It's one of the two pillars on which modern physics uh, stands. And this, the clue to this theory lay in this tiny little one in a million anomaly. And this is an, just an illustration of just how powerful these things can be. Now, so uh, actually, to, to, to sort of, this is a quote that's very close to my heart, which I think captures this rather nicely. This is a, something that Isaac Asimov, the American science fiction writer, said, which is the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries, isn't Eureka, but, hmm, that's funny. And so this talk is really about uh, I'm going to talk to you, tell you about one particular mm, that's funny thing that's going on in particle physics at the moment, but there are a whole bunch of these things that could be the clues to a new view of nature. So to begin with, I just want to sort of set the scene and say, well, why do we actually think that there is more out there in fundamental physics to discover? In particle physics, we have this stonkingly successful theory known as the standard model of particle physics, which is a very boring name for what is probably 
I think, the greatest intellectual achievement of human beings. This is a quantum field theory that describes the basic constituents of our universe. And in fact, it describes pretty much everything in the physical world that we can see, at least. It describes the atoms and particles that we're made of, the material that makes up all the visible universe, stars, galaxies, and so on. And it does this with absolutely dazzling and sometimes maddeningly uh, sort of accurate precision. So it's, it's an incredible theory. Um, but despite all its successes, we know, uh, thanks to astronomy, that it cannot be the final word when it comes to fundamental physics. So it's been known for a long time that if you look at galaxies such as our nearest neighbour Andromeda and you measure the speeds with which stars are orbiting that galaxy, they are moving too fast for the gravitational f attraction of the visible matter to actually hold them in their orbits. They're going so quickly they should fly off into intergalactic space. This first evidence of what we call dark matter was discovered by Vera Rubin, the American astronomer, in the 1970s. And we now have an overwhelming amount of evidence that the universe is actually dominated by this invisible substance whose gravity shapes the structure of visible matter at very large scales. But at the moment, we have no fundamental understanding of what dark matter is. In other words, there is no particle in the standard model that can explain this stuff. Um, and so this illustrates the, the spectacular state of our ignorance, if you like. This is a pie chart that shows what we think the universe is made from based on our best astronomical measurements. So here we have this 5% slice labelled atoms. That is us. So that is the Earth, the stars, basically everything, every star and galaxy and speck of dust, cloud of gas in the night sky. That is what is described by the standard model of particle physics. You have this 27% lump of dark matter, and we have no idea what that is. And then there's this 68% thing called dark energy, and we really don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> Dark energy is some kind of repulsive force that is causing the universe to expand at an accelerating rate. But these words, dark energy, dark matter, they are really just terms to cover our ignorance. We have no fundamental understanding yet of what they are. And for this reason alone, we know there must be new things in particle physics to discover because there must be a fundamental understand, uh, explanation for these phenomena. And that's why we go out and we do experiments and we try to discover new particles. But another way that you can look for new particles is it, rather than sort of looking directly, say, in some detector for a new particle to pop up, you can actually take another approach, which is make, to make precision measurements of properties of known particles that can give you clues to the existence of things we've not seen before. And the anomaly I'm going to talk to you about in this talk is, is an example, a very good example of that. So. Um, to begin with, I, I want to sort of set the, the, the scene a little bit. Um, this is a, a representation of the spectrum of hydrogen. So if you take hydrogen gas, you put it in a glass tube and you pass an electric current through, and then you split the light that comes out of that hydrogen lamp, you'll see these two uh, bright colored lines, one that's kind of cyanish in color and one that's red. And what you're seeing here is visible evidence of quantum mechanics. So these, these spectral lines, as we call them, these colours that are emitted by hydrogen atoms correspond to the transitions of electrons from different orbits around the hydrogen atom from one orbit to another. So thanks to quantum mechanics, this is our sort of very basic cartoon model of the hydrogen atom where you have a proton in the middle and then a single electron orbiting the hydrogen atom. And what quantum theory says is that electrons cannot orbit at any distance or, uh, from the, the nucleus. They only orbit in these fixed energy levels, which I've labelled 1, 2, 3 and 4, for example, in this case. Now, in the lamp, what is happening is that you normally the electron sits in the lowest energy level. So it's a, this n equals 1 state. But when you pass an electric current through the lamp, it kicks the electrons, it excites them and they get kicked up to higher levels. And then they de-excite, so they'll then fall back to lower energy levels. And when they do that, they emit photons, they emit particles of light that carry away the difference in energy between these levels. So for example, here we have an electron going around in the, the third orbital, and as it goes around, eventually it will de-excite and it can drop down to the second level, and it emits, in doing that, a red-coloured photon. That's where that red line comes from. It can also drop down instead from the fourth level to the second, and that gives you this bluish line. So the bluish line is, is a higher frequency because the gap between four and two is a bit bigger than three and four. So it's a higher energy particle of light. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, 
this, it was actually the study of this hydrogen spectrum back in the 1940s that led to another very profound realization. Uh, back in 1940, uh, a physicist called Willis Lamb had spent some time microwaving hydrogen atoms. And he had discovered something rather strange, which was that this N equals two level, this second energy level in hydrogen, in the established quantum theory of the time, there should only be basically one energy level at N equals two with one energy. What Lamb found was that there was again a one in a million discrepancy and actually if you look very carefully at this level it actually splits into two different levels with a one part in a million difference between them. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.